Hey folks, uh, welcome to another class. Uh, today we're going to be talking about sort of an overview of the war running from the end of the Peninsula Campaign uh, to Chancellorsville. Uh, we're doing this because the next stop on sort of this class journey is The Red Badge of Courage, our first literary work that we're going to be reading. And it takes place at the Battle of Chancellorsville. So we'll spend a, a whole lecture on Chancellorsville and what goes on there to give you the background so that you can understand the Red Badge of Courage. Uh, but today we're going to have two lectures. We'll start with this one, and then I need to introduce your next paper. I'm going to be grading your papers on um, the compare and contrast this week, and I'll get those back to you. Keep your eyes open for an email that's going to have comments on the paper itself and uh, a link to an uh, unlisted YouTube video in which I give you the feedback that you need for your papers. Anyway, on to today's material. The Peninsula to Chancellorsville. Uh, so just an update, like the Peninsula campaign ended at the, you know, July of 1862. And um, from there, we're going to we're gonna skip most of a year uh, and we'll come around to uh, spring, early summer of 1863 for Chancellorsville. Uh, next time. So that's that's what I got to sort of cover here. We're focusing mainly on Virginia. I'm going to stay focused on Virginia, but we also need to talk about sort of the, the national ramifications of what's going on in the Civil War, which I hinted at in the last lecture. Anyway, uh, over the course of that time period, the Union had a lot of success in capturing territory. Um, Ulysses S. Grant captured Forts Henry and Donaldson at the, the top of the Mississippi River and sort of gained control of that area. Um, Admiral Farragut took New Orleans, uh, and so New Orleans was in uh, federal or Union hands as well. Uh, Memphis, Tennessee fell uh, to the Union, uh, and then areas of coastal Virginia and areas of coastal North Carolina and Galveston, Texas were all taken by amphibious invasions. The South could not control all of its, you know, ports, and so um, it ended up losing a, a number of them. Uh, you know, which makes sense. Uh, also, the North won the major battles of Shiloh and Antietam. We're going to talk about Antietam briefly today, uh, but Shiloh took place in Tennessee. Uh, it, was a, it was a huge battle, one of the largest of the war, um, between Ulysses S. Grant and uh, notably General Sherman and uh, Beauregard and a different Johnston um, out on the, on the southern side. So uh, some names that you recognize there probably. Uh, the Union naval blockade had continued to cause havoc with the South, basically uh, between controlling both ends of the Mississippi and um, blockading all the Confederate ports, it was destroying the Confederate economy. Their economy was in the tank. Things were looking pretty bad for them economically. Uh, and to make matters worse for the South, better for a lot of people in the United States, but worse for the South, is that Lincoln made the Emancip Emancipation Proclamation, which took effect January 1st, 1863. Uh, so, you know, you probably heard about the Emancipation Proclamation, you know, uh, it's, it's complicated and, and it's worth talking about. Um, it allowed former slaves and free black men to fight in the Union Army. That was one big outcome, which helped the North. Uh, if you've ever watched the movie Glory, uh, it's about this and I would highly recommend it. Uh, a good movie for sure. Um, it also destabilizes the Confederate economy because, it was a slave-based economy, and, and as these slaves started to learn that if they ran away to the North, they would no longer be contraband or return to their uh, masters through fugitive slave laws, they would actually be free, a lot of them decided to leave uh, their plantations and, and make a break for it. And certainly, who can blame them? Uh, so that destabilized the Southern economy. Uh, it also, you know, when you think about the South, uh, and a third of their population is... Um, enslaved people, you can imagine the fear that this caused, uh, especially with so many of the the men off to fight in the Civil War. Uh, it also sort of destabilized the the entire area. Uh, so it was kind of a big master stroke for Lincoln. And I, I, you know, it sounds like it definitely was something Lincoln wanted to do. I mean, he was he was anti-slavery even early in his political campaigns. Uh, he made speeches about it and, and stuff like that. Uh, but he hadn't done anything about it up until now because he still had this idea 
that the South might come around, that some of these states that were in rebellion might return to the Union, and he didn't want to antagonize them. But I think at this point in the war, he had hit the point where, one, the, the pressure from the Republican politicians was mounting on him, and uh, they wanted him to make this uh, Emancipation Proclamation to abolish slavery. And so he, he sort of had to give in to the pressure of his party a little bit. Uh, but two, uh, he saw the advantage of it. One, it, it gives him more soldiers. Two, it destabilizes the southern economy. And three, it also discourages European intervention in the war. Uh, the Europeans had all outlawed slavery, and so slavery was one of the things that was stopping countries like the United Kingdom and France from getting involved on the side of the Confederacy. And so, um, here comes the dog. You can hear it, little nails on the floor. Um, but... Anyway, there, there were a lot of political reasons for this, too. It wasn't just out of the good of Lincoln's heart. Though The truth is that he wanted it to happen, and this may have just been the excuse to allow him to do it. Uh, on the other side, um, you can see how all these things are good for the North, and it puts the South in a very difficult position. The Confederacy is, is feeling the hurt here quite a bit. But on the other side of the coin, um, the Confederacy captured Harper's Ferry. That was a, uh, a big armory. Um, that was right around the time of the Battle of Antietam, which we'll talk about. Um, there were also Confederate victories in uh, the Shenandoah campaign, which we talked about with Jackson fighting uh, all those battles in the Shenandoah. Uh, the South won the Peninsula campaign and chased McClellan off the peninsula. And so they protected Richmond there. So that was a big military victory. They win a battle at Cedar Mountain. Uh, we're going to talk about that today. They win second Manassas and they win Fredericksburg. So in Virginia anyway, even if they're not winning out South against Grant, uh, the Confederate forces continue to win stunning victory after stunning victory, despite the fact that they're, they're outmatched uh, in terms of numbers, in terms of equipment, in terms of resources, in terms of supplies, uh, you name it. And, and pretty much every way you can think of, uh, the, the Southern Army is outmatched, except in terms of leadership. Uh, their military leadership is superb, and you can see that throughout the course of the war. Here's a map for you. Um, of 1863. This is 10th March 1863. Uh, you can see the Union blockade there and how it's it's keeping the South um, bottled up. If you look really closely, you can sort of see yellow patches along the coast. Those are all little amphibious landings that the North has made. Um, you can see that Nor New Orleans has fallen, that the, the river, uh, the Mississippi River, is pretty much under Northern control, sort of splitting the South in two there. You can also see the areas of Tennessee um, have and, and Arkansas have uh, been taken over by the Union forces and that West Virginia has broken away from Virginia and become its own state allied with the Union. Uh, all of these things are going on and all of these things are, are impacting the South. So um, one of the big outcomes of the Peninsula Campaign is that uh, Johnston got injured and Robert E. Lee took command of the Army of Northern Virginia. And he was a masterful commander. He won that Peninsula campaign, even though he was distinctly outnumbered. He did take more casualties because he was launching attacks against McClellan. Uh, but he outmaneuvered McClellan. He organized his forces better. And he ultimately forced a much larger and better supplied Union force down the peninsula away and away from Richmond. Winning that campaign, he had 29,000 casualties to McClellan's 24. And we'll talk about McClellan casualties later. This is a pretty good ratio, and that's what McClellan really wanted. But he didn't take Richmond, which is what Lincoln really wanted. And so he was he was sort of in a bad state at this point. He had been ordered to withdraw, and that was kind of a big deal. Uh, we also talked earlier about Stonewall Jackson, one of the greatest generals of the Confederacy. He won that Shenandoah Valley campaign. Um, he caused 5,000 casualties at the loss of 2,000 men when he had a total force of 17,000 men and the Union force was around 50,000 men. So that's that's just absolutely amazing. Um, he's also the, the mind behind the Battle of Cedar Mountain. If you watch the videos that I, I had for you this week, you would have seen the Battle of Cedar Mountain. Um, the Union lost 2,300 men and the Confederacy had 1,300 casualties at the Battle of Cedar Mountain. Um, and here's a map that sort of shows what's going on. We'll come back to this map again. But when Lee won uh, the battle or the Peninsula Campaign and forced McClellan back, McClellan's guys all had to board ships and sail up the Potomac River. And that's what they did. You can see that they're going to get off there. It says arrive August 22nd there on the right by Aquia Landing. Um, I've been there. It's kind of cool. Uh but whatever the case, McClellan's guys all had to get on ships and move, which allowed a bit of freedom to the Confederate armies. They were able to move unchecked through Virginia. And 
as we talked about um, last time, sort of the, the Napoleonic tactics of destroying in detail, Lee saw an opportunity where he could outnumber various Union forces if he moved quickly. And so he ordered Jackson north. Uh, there was an army coming down uh, that was controlled by this guy named Porter, and it had reached Culpeper, and it was about to cut off some supplies to Richmond. And so um, Jackson marched famously as fast as he could up, and he arrived, uh, and they fought a battle at a place called, um, oops, I'm going too high up, uh, Cedar Mountain. You can see it there on the left. I, again, I wish I had a little pointer that I could highlight it for, for you there. Uh, but they fought that battle at Cedar Mountain. And it was, it was sort of a stalemate, but it favored the Confederacy because it stopped Pope's advance. Pope had to back off. And then Lee was able to bring his army up with his, his General Longstreet, and uh, they were able to outmatch Pope, and Pope had to retreat across the Rappahannock River, which resulted in a battle of Rappahannock Station. Now, that's particularly fun for me because I live in the town of Rappahannock Station. It's not called Rappahannock Station anymore, but for a long time it was. And so this, this battle happened, like, right in my backyard, which is which is pretty cool. So uh, there was a quick battle at Rappahannock Station, um, and then uh, what happened next is the Battle of Second Manassas. We'll talk about Second Manassas in a second. Uh, Jackson is involved in Second Manassas, but Jackson's next campaign, um, the, right before the Battle of Antietam, was the Siege of Harper's Ferry. We talked about that briefly earlier. It was absolutely amazing. The guy has a reputation as a stunning general, and, and this is why. Um, he, at the, for the loss of 300 men, he captured an entire army of Union soldiers who surrendered. 12,000 Union soldiers surrendered at Harper's Ferry to the Confederates um, at the loss of 300 men. Uh, one of the worst defeats of the, the Federal Army in the entire war. Uh, the other general of the Confederacy that, that we need to talk about and we need to sort of get used to talking about is James Longstreet. He he actually had a pretty rough reputation after the war in the South, but it was it was sort of undeserved. Um, Longstreet's going to be an important figure for you uh, because he plays a big role in the Civil War, but also because he's one of the protagonists of the second novel we're going to read in this class, which is um, Gods and Generals, or um, The Killer Angels. I guess it's called The Killer Angels. Uh, but it's, it's a great book, and he's one of your protagonists, so you're going to get inside his head and sort of see things. He's the hero of Second Manassas. Uh, he, he is able to... Uh, route Pope's army, and um, he causes 14,000 casualties for a loss of only 7,000, which is kind of a big deal. And, and we'll get back right back to the same map we were at before and sort of talk about this. If you can follow the little arrows and lines. Uh, we had that battle at Cedar Mountain down there on the left. You can see August 9th. Um, then we had a battle at Brandy Station. And then uh, Lee is sort of uh, up against, uh, sorry, at Rappahannock Station. Lee is up against the Rappahannock River, and he can't really cross it. And so he does a really good job of sending uh, Jackson to the left and Longstreet to the left. And uh, they go around the Union lines, and the Union is forced to withdraw because they've been flanked. And they end up back at our good old uh, friend Manassas. Uh, the North calls this the Second Battle of Bull Run. The South calls it the Second Battle of Manassas. Um, that battle, uh, I gave you a video about it that you could have watched, um, but Jackson arrived there first because his infantry marched like cavalry, uh, and he was able to set up along the road. He, he was actually in a, um, a half-constructed railroad, uh, that was sort of going through sort of a divot in the ground, like a natural trench, well, not natural, a trench that had been made uh, for the railroad to lay the tracks on and make it flat. And so the um, Union soldiers didn't know he was there, and he was parallel to the road, and the Union soldiers were marching on the road, and he attacked them, and they didn't know it was coming. And so they got they got attacked by Jackson, and then they didn't retreat. They actually formed up and fought Jackson to a standstill all day. Um, it was a pretty interesting little engagement. Uh, nobody really won that one. And the next day, Pope lined up his troops and decided to fight Jackson, but he had no idea that Longstreet was also coming from that flank. And so Longstreet flanked his army, and uh, the Union army was... I won't say routed. They actually held together pretty well, primarily because of McClellan's training, uh, and they were able to withdraw, but they lost casualties at a rate of more than two to one, um, which is, is stunning. And it says something about Longstreet's ability as a tactical commander. Now, Lee gets credit for all of these. At the end of the day, Lee was the commander of the whole army, but his two greatest generals were Longstreet 
and Jackson, and they did a lot of, of the work. Whenever you hear about Union generals, um, especially generals who aren't the main general, usually you're hearing about their bumbling incompetence, and a lot of them are, are sort of uh, political officers, guys who use their political uh, clout to get themselves general positions in the army. Uh, we're going to meet a guy named Burnside, who was uh, a railroad baron who made himself... Well, I mean, he did go to he did go to West Point in his time, but he had, he had given up his commission, and he had never done anything particularly successful in the army uh, and then he was made a general and then he ended up becoming the guy who took over for McClelland and we'll talk about that I'm getting ahead of myself uh, but Manassas was a victory for the South second Manassas and that left our boy George McClellan in a bad way uh, he had been uh, failing to successfully fight Ooh, what did we do um, well I guess I just lost that uh, give me one second the Whoa, why, Ted? All right. I should probably just pause this, but, you know, here we are. Uh, thank you. The Peninsula to Chancellorsville. We'll get back to it. I don't know what happened there, but bear with me. Um, back to our boy McClelland. What's going on with the Union Army? Well, the Union Army withdrew from the Peninsula, and uh, McClellan did not get to fight Lee. Lee was fighting these minor generals such as Pope and Banks. You guys remember Banks. Um, and um, being very successful in doing it. Uh, McClellan had, though, even though he lost the Peninsula campaign, he had won it in terms of losses of soldiers. The South could not afford to lose men. McClellan knew that. Um, he was always very cautious. Uh, he did not like risking his army unnecessarily. But... Uh, you know, Lincoln wanted the swift victory. He knew that the North had overwhelming force and that the South couldn't stand up to a, a determined attack, and he wanted somebody who was going to attack. But he couldn't yet get rid of McClellan. Remember, McClellan had sort of a hero worship thing going on with his army. His army loved him. And, and so Lincoln couldn't safely remove McClellan from his position at this point. Um, and this brings us to the Antietam campaign. Now, Antietam happened in September. Um, the last two battles happened in August. Uh, Antietam happened in September of 1862. Lee realized that he couldn't go on fighting a defensive war in Virginia and expect to win. Eventually, the North, with their industrial might, with their better uh, capability to produce soldiers, would just outlast him and, and face him down. So he knew he had to defeat the North, and the only way to defeat the North was to bring them to terms. Washington was very far south. And he thought if he could cut Washington off, he could put North the North in a very bad position and maybe bring Lincoln to the table. He also thought if he could win some victories in Union territory, he might be able to get some of that long-sought-for help from European powers. Uh, he thought the European powers were, were cautious because they didn't think the South could win, and maybe if he could show them that he could win by beating the Union in their own territory, uh, he could get... Uh, the United Kingdom to help. And that's what they desperately needed. They wanted that blockade broken. They wanted those ships out of the way so that they could trade cotton and have their economy back. And then maybe, maybe with the money that they had, they could be successful. Um, anyway, uh, Antietam was a Confederate defeat, uh, but there's a lot to it. Lee decided he took, would take his army of Northern Virginia and march into Maryland and get North of Washington, D.C., where he thought if he won a decisive victory, he could sort of plant his army north of D.C., and without any defenses between himself and Washington, Lincoln would have to come to the table. They'd have to have peace talks. Uh, it didn't turn out that way. Uh, he did have some very successful uh, events. We talked briefly about the Siege of Harper's Ferry, uh, September 13th, 1862. Uh, if you recall, Jackson's first assignment in the Confederate Army was to defend Harper's Ferry, and he realized very quickly that Harper's Ferry was indefensible. It's surrounded by three hills. Uh, any enemy could put guns on those three hills and just blast you into oblivion, and you couldn't defeat them. And then if you wanted to get out of there, you had to go up the hills or across the river. Both of those options are terrible options. Uh, however, the Union decided to garrison the place with 12 thousand soldiers uh, under a guy named Mills, I believe. And uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, it was a it was a disaster. Uh, Jackson arrived 
he split his forces and put guns on all three hills and started obliterating the place. And soon enough, uh, Mills had to surrender, and he surrendered, and the, the Confederates captured that entire army, which was a huge blow uh, to the Union. And this looked really bad for them. However, McClellan knew what was going on. He was nervous about it, and so he moved with, with surprising speed. He was not a speedy guy, generally speaking, and Lee thought he had more time than he did. And so McClellan was able to ca catch elements of Lee's army at um, uh, Fox's and Turner's Gap and Compton's Gap, and there were some battles fought. Uh, Lee had to retreat. He found a place where he thought he could, he could fight a good fight uh, next to a creek or a river called Antietam. Uh, which is what the battle ended up being named for. Remember that, that Union battles are often named for um, water features like Bull Run, and the South would name it the Battle of Sharpsburg, but that didn't, that didn't catch on. It ended up being uh, known as the Battle of Antietam because it was a Union victory. Um, even though the North lost more men overall in the battle, uh, the South uh, had to retreat, and the invasion of the North was aborted. It could no longer continue. And so it was a tactical victory for the North and for McClellan. Um, I don't need to go into the details. It's it's an interesting battle, certainly. Uh, I would say the, the thing that if you're going to have, have a takeaway from the Battle of Antietam, it was the single bloodiest day of the Civil War. I, up until that point, certainly. Um, I think it still may be one of the three uh, worst days in American history in terms of casualties. Remember that both sides were... Um, were, were Americans. And so when you're looking at 22,000 casualties in one day of fighting, I mean, that's just absolutely staggering. Uh, so anyway, that battle, that battle went on and uh, McClellan won it. The problem was that McClellan, in his typical way, felt that Lee had more men than he did and didn't press it at his advantage. He could have chased Lee. He could have he could have trapped Lee against the Potomac River and defeated the Northern Army of Northern Virginia entirely, but he did not. He allowed Lee to escape. And uh, for this, Lincoln fired him. Uh, so McClellan lost his job with um, as, as the general of the Army of the Potomac, and Lincoln had to find a new general. And the guy that he picked is this delightful-looking dude, Ambrose Burnside. The, the fact that his name is Burnside and he has those sideburns that, like, meld into his mustache in this absolutely horrifying way, no offense, Burnside, is, is kind of crazy. Uh, but he was the opposite of McClellan. He was a risk-taker. He had been a, sort of a railroad baron and... Um, you know, he had made a lot of money by taking measured risks, and he felt that he knew what to do. He had studied the tactics of Napoleon. Napoleon's tactics were marched to the sound of the guns. Uh, he felt that he had the manpower to lead an offensive campaign. And so he took over McClellan's army, uh, and he decided that he was going to attack Fredericksburg. Uh, this was a horrible horrible disaster. Uh, one of the things we've talked about in this class is that technology had changed, and so battle now favored the defense, especially when the defense entrenched themselves, uh, which they had learned to do by this point in the war. And so uh, Burnside decided that he would just use the, the brute force and mass of his men to launch a series of charges and unseat the South from Fredericksburg. Once he passed through Fredericksburg, he planned to go on to Richmond and just brute force his way into Richmond and thereby uh, take the South. What's interesting about this is that's pretty much the tactic that Grant used successfully uh, to win the war. And, and, you know, maybe Burnside and Grant aren't all that different in terms of their overall tactical ideologies. It's just that Burnside tried to do it at a time when it could not be successful and Grant had the resources and the South had lost enough resources that the tactics had, had sort of changed. Anyway, uh, I don't think Grant would have, would have launched these attacks. He wouldn't have been stupid enough to attack uphill. Um, if you, if you look at the Battle of Fredericksburg, and this one that's worth studying too, if you want to write your paper on this one, you're welcome to, um, Burnside created pontoon bridges and forded the Rappahannock River into Fredericksburg, and then he sent his guys charging up hills at massed infantry and cannons, and they charged and were repulsed, and charged and were repulsed, and charged and were repulsed. And this continued both against Longstreet's soldiers on Mary's Heights and against Jackson's soldiers on Prospect Hill. Um, they tried to take these two hills 
over and over and over again. And at the end of the day, the casualties are staggering. The Union lost 12,000 men. That's the same number they lost at Antietam. But instead of killing 10,000 men, they only they only caused 5,000 casualties to the Southern Army. Um, they had to retreat over the bridge and back to Washington, and Burnside had created a lot of enemies. Remember that there was sort of a hero worship going on with McClellan. His army loved him. Well, the army hated Burnside. Absolutely hated him. And now, by the way, I mean, let's look at his face again. I get it. No offense, Burnside. Uh, but he... He was a terrible commander. He was autocratic. He he forced people into situations that they didn't want to be in, especially Hooker, who lost like half his command in one fight, was really angry at him. And then Burnside decided to essentially do the same thing over again. He tried to set a second campaign in the middle of winter. Uh, this, one, this one took place in December. But he tried to get down there again, but he got bogged down in the mud. And so it was called um, the Mud Marches, and they had to turn around and go back. At that point, the Army of the Potomac was so angry at Burnside that there was almost a wholesale mutiny or, or kind of mini-rebellion by the officers. They all plotted against him and talked to Lincoln. And um, Burnside went to Lincoln and said, either you you court-martial all these guys for insubordination or I resign. And Lincoln was like, okay, resign. <laughs> and so Burnside resigned his, his commission as the, he ended, he's still a general. He ended up being transferred. So he didn't, he didn't get out of the army entirely, but he resigned as commander of the army, of the Potomac, and he was shifted out to um, Tennessee, I believe. Uh, anyway, uh, that was a, that was a horrible disaster for the union. And the Union still needed a general. They couldn't bring McClellan back. He had been fired. And now Burnside was absolutely terrible. And so they looked for somebody to be their new general. And if you look back, Hooker was a general who fought on Mary's Height against Longstreet and lost half his command, obeying an order from Burnside. He was also instrumental in sort of the coup to get rid of Burnside. And he put himself in position to be the next general. Uh, he was referred to by the newspaper as Fighting Joe Hooker. He was... Uh, he was a pretty interesting guy, um, mostly as a terrible commander, which we're going to see shortly. He actually lost the Battle of Chancellorsville, uh, which was another serious Union defeat. You can see the Union's going to lose 17,000 men and the Confederacy 13,000. It's not nearly as bad as, you know, what goes on with Burnside. But when you consider the fact that the North was kind of defending on this one and he still lost, it's, it's a pretty... It's a pretty unfortunate deal. Uh, he was also really famous for gambling, womanizing, and, um, you know, drinking. And so he spent a lot of his time, uh, he and his officers, doing things that you wouldn't necessarily think are particularly uh, military things to do. And you can sort of see it in his demeanor here. Uh, so Fighting Joe Hooker is the next guy who's going to take over the, the Army of the Potomac, and he is not going to do a great job. Spoiler alert. Uh, and that's where we're going to be next time. So, so we sort of caught you up uh, with the things that are going on in the war, uh, both in the Grand War, when you think about New Orleans and Galveston and, and um, all of the things that are going on uh, outside of Virginia, but also Virginia, which is very much a story of Confederate victory after Confederate victory and bumbling, incompetent um, Union officers repeating the same mistakes over and over again because they can't find themselves a competent general, and that will eventually change. All right, I'm going to stop this video. Uh, if you guys have any questions, do not hesitate to email me. I'm more than happy to talk to you. Um, and remember, you have a paper coming up. We're going to talk about it in just a second, about a battle that occurred locally um, in Virginia or Maryland before the Battle of Gettysburg. So you've got until, um, you know, about... Uh, July of 1863 to to decide what battle you want. But I've got a list on there, um, and we'll talk about it in a second. But um, a number of the ones that we talked about today might be excellent choices for you. All right, I'm going to shut up now. Thank you for your time and attention. All right. If I can make it stop. Come on now.